Episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you a season review for a show that I had a chance to binge watch this past week, um, along with an update for the mid-season completion of the show. Um, granted, I am subscribed to AMC Plus for this particular show, so um, there will be a bit of a potential spoiler as far as some commentary goes, but because it doesn't really, or because it's mostly speculation of what's going to happen, it's not too big of a spoiler. Um, the last, not the last episode, but the week before's episode introduced this idea, so that's why it's not really a full um, spoiler alert. And then I'm gonna round it out with an update on the gameplay that I'm, or the video game that I'm playing, and an Android Google Quick Tip. So to start it off, um, while browsing Twitter over the past like week and a half or so, I kept seeing a lot of positive feedback for the Netflix show FUBAR. And this is the full first season, and I say first season because they kind of left it to a, at a point where they could potentially have a second season. This is the show starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Monica Barbaro. Uh, you probably know her, or at least I know her from Top Gun Maverick. So. Um, those are your main stars. You do have a special appearance by Tom Arnold. And then everybody else is not necessarily people that are well known, but it's people I didn't know. But over, and the lady who played Arnold Schwarzenegger's wife looked kind of familiar. I'm not sure why. And I didn't really look. But overall, I want to say that all the feedback that the show has been getting is definitely worth it. It's a very good show. It's funny, lighthearted, serious when it needs to be and overall a good time um and even though all most of the episodes are at about an hour long generally like maybe 50 to 55 minutes but the eight episodes go by really fast because they're well paced they're um packed with enough content and well paced enough to make them go by very very smoothly as far as what the show is about if you remember the movie true lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Tom Arnold, then essentially this is kind of the aftermath of that. Um, years later, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character is getting ready to retire. Um, he's not able to. He, he's uh, coming to grips with trying to tell his family the truth. He's divorced. And then he comes to learn that his daughter is part of the CIA now too. So dealing with that news, um, his disapproval with her boyfriend, um, his son's app that he's trying to release and all of that so all in all it's very well done and is balanced with all of that so the same kind of th things that we saw in True Lies you kind of get more of that and a little bit more breathing room for all the different content and story arcs and interactions and things like that so if you haven't seen it already then I definitely recommend giving it a watch it's well worth it and they do leave it at a good point to introduce a season two um, the only thing that I was kind of bummed about was that they didn't have Jamie Lee Curtis on the show, but um, it also feels like they kind of left that open to introduce her character in season two, potentially, um, and maybe introduce her whether as another ex-wife or as a second wife or, or first wife or something like that, deal with her somehow, but I, it would kind of be nice to have an acknowledgement of her character. Uh, so with that being said, the next review that's up is the is episodes 5 and 6 for Fear the Walking Dead. Uh, both episodes are kind of still dealing with the aftermath of the revelation of Padre that the general is dead, then his kids are taking over, and they were kind of repurposing what his intended mission was. Um, everyone now knows about the walkers and the supplies that were supposed to, supposed to be seeded to all these different communities. And that's kind of where we're um, dealing with as far as um, kind of freeing the kids, changing their mind, um, undoing the years of training that Padre was giving them to 
make them realize that this is not the way to go, reuniting the kids with their parents and all of that. So nothing too special there, but season, or sorry, episode six actually ends in a particularly good way because we have the continuing after effects of Morgan's, um, or basically it's all about the title of the episode, All I See Is Red. So um, it deals with that, the aftermath of, um, having to kill his wife and daughter even though they were in zombie form um uh, freeing mo and um, her running away because of the death of her mom and dealing with that um but the end of the season actually i don't know if it actually predicts what we're gonna see in the second half of the season or if it's gonna tie into the um rick grimes movie but essentially we have morgan now going out to look for rick wherever he may be potentially starting at alexandria and keeping on going there and doing this with mo so part of me feels like they're gonna spend a lot of time with that and then switch between that and morgan and the kids um seeding all these communities or um ultimately rick or uh, morgan finding rick and helping seed the communities because he's part of the commonwealth or crm or whatever hopefully it ties to the bigger walking dead universe as a whole but it's hard to say what they're gonna do or even tie in directly with the rick grimes movie and what that's gonna be all about i don't know i haven't really read too much but i'm kind of guessing that that's gonna be um what's been going on with rick since all the events of what happened at the bridge in the one episode in the walking dead so potentially or my theory for the rest of fear of the walking dead is Morgan and Mo are gonna find Rick. They're gonna uh, realize that he's alive and he's trying to be, rebuild society. They're gonna use the supplies that Padre had built up and help seed either more communities or the communities that are there and help them grow from there and build up all of that. So that's kind of where we left it off. It was an okay mid-season finale. Um, I was listening to some podcasts and reading some reviews about how about how many times can Morgan go back and forth with his character, but it's one of those things I feel like he's always struggled with, had trouble with. So hopefully having that resolution now, or at least having Mo with him, so that it doesn't happen again, and then Kim is around as a, an additional fallback that they can potentially bring him back um, if he does start to go down that route again, or keep themselves out of danger so he doesn't do that anymore and help him focus on the task at hand. Um, now we did have a um, end scene after all of this where we see a person pick up some glasses and a, I guess an arm brace or a fake arm or something like that. So I did a quick Google search and it's potentially Alicia. I was kind of hoping that this was um, gonna be like a Rick Easter egg or something, but the person's arms were kind of too skinny for it to be or what it could have been as Rick's arm, so that's fine, I guess. So we'll see how that goes, but it's not too much of a scene. You don't see their face, you don't know what they're up to, where they're going, but um, maybe it's also one of those things where Alicia was saved by Rick. She um, knows about, or she's been keeping tabs on what's going going on with Padre. She now knows that her mom is alive, so they're gonna tie out season six by bringing all of them together and then going back to Rick to build the communities and deal with stuff that way. So we'll see how it goes, a decent season eight mid-season finale. So we'll see how the rest of the season goes from here. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to watch this um, episode ahead of um, this weekend was that we're gonna get the season premiere for The Walking Dead, Dead City, the show with uh, Maggie and Negan so um, that will be on next week's episode as far as a review but I kind of didn't want to mix Fear the Walking Dead and Dead City so we'll so I'm kind of doing that review now this review now to save the next week's review for Dead City so that's all that there is for as far as stuff I've been watching um, I've been continuing to play Assassin's Creed Origin so if you follow me on social media you may have seen that I made a post about how I'm going to be approaching the game, but if you didn't, I'll give the update here and how it's going. So I got to a point where it's now, or I'm now in the end game for the game, the game story basically. So um, I guess I'm supposed to go after Caesar. Um, all the different that the people as part of the secret society are all um, dead. So 
now is going after Caesar and the Romans and dealing with all of that. But all of the missions that were showing up in the quest log were missions that were above my skill level and more than a couple of levels over my current level. So I think I was at like 30 or 31 and all the missions were set at like 35. So even though I could potentially go to them, I would they would essentially be one hit kills or unable to move or anything like that. So what I thought I would try is to start clearing a bunch of the side quest missions to level up my character a whole bunch. So, you know, go after all the loot treasures, go after all those small stories of different, lo of different locations to um, help the people of Egypt um, find additional fast travel locations to get easy XP there and things like that. So I was able to get up to level 33 where I now have a legendary sword that catches on fire. So once I got there, um, a lot of different missions became even more easier just because even though I was above the level or at the level to finish them, um, it became a little a lot more easier just because I now have a weapon that's that much more powerful to attack enemies. So um, as of now, I'm at I think level 35 or 36. So essentially I spent a couple of um, gameplay videos just working on that level up, uh, accomplishing different side quests and collecting loot and things like that. And then I got to the point where I could start working on some of those other missions and side quests that were more story related and more important and interesting than just, you know, looting a small quest for taking out Romans or random guards and stuff like that. Um, I was also finishing some of the quests to get loot, um, killing the captains and guards and things like that for another way to get easy XP. So. Um, now that I'm at level 35, I was able to finish a couple of extra stories to help uh, rebels take out a random uh, queen princess lady, I think, so and save some people there and save some prisoners. So essentially, I'm, I think I'm almost done there. So there's a couple of more quests that are left over prior to the uh, Caesar um, quest. So I'm going to take care of those and... Um, continue to work on those quests as I see them. So once I finish, so the current plan is once I finish those um, extra couple of quests, then I'm going to take the Caesar quest because I think that one is also at 35 or 36. So since I'm already at that level, then I can now work on it to complete that level. Um, but I also do want to complete some of the other side quests just to. I don't know that I'm. I think I'm in like the middle of a level up, so I'm not necessarily going to be able to level up one more time, but because the quest is at my current skill level uh, for my character that I should be able to take care of all of those pretty easily and more straightforward and continue on into that um, quest. And we'll see how it picks up for the rest of the uh, game and the levels and things like that. So um, like I said earlier, I'm in the, now I'm in the end game, the last few levels. So um, I don't know if, um, how, how much more of a level up I'm going to need to do, but essentially I'm going to take that approach where um, once I finish the other two side quests or two or three or whatever side quests and then I finish the Caesar level, then I'm going to take a look at the next um, main story quest and see what kind of level I need to finish that. If it's above my skill level, then do more side missions. If it's at my current skill level, then go ahead and accept it and keep going and see how it goes from there. But um, overall, the story and gameplay becomes that much more easier. One of the things that I should have done to begin with was finish all those side quests as I was going and in that region to finish them up and take care of them. But on the flip side, um, it is that much easier to finish those quests because there a bunch of them were like, you know, 10 or 5 levels below my current skill level. So it was easy to just, you know, hack and slash my way through them, get a bunch of easy XP, and then level up super quickly. So I think. I did in about a week what probably would have taken a little bit longer to do if I was at the skill level that was required. So if the mission required a level of 24 and I was at 24, it probably would have been harder than doing that level or that level 24 mission at level uh, 31 or whatever. So uh, that being said, uh, all the gameplay videos are on YouTube and they're published um, as soon as they're ready. So that's at youtube.com slash pateln01. So as far as rounding out this particular episode, I wanted to give a um, Android 
And I don't know that it's Android specific, but because I'm on Android, that's why I'll mention it. But I wanted to give a Google quick tip if you're a Google Photos user and a Google One subscriber. So let's say you take a lot of pictures and you back them up on Google Photos, you like a lot, you have some portrait um, images, and I know this is a feature on, or I believe this is a feature on iPhones where it creates this like 3D image that kind of rotates around a little bit. For a while, Google was doing that as well, that it would automatically create it if the color depth or whatever on the picture was um, high enough and it can automatically create it. But Google Photos um, on the mobile app now lets you create a manual version of that picture that's called Cinematic Photo. So what you would do is you'll go into Google Photos, click on the library tab, the bottom right button on the app, and then you'll go into utilities and then you'll see an item near the top of the screen called cinematic photo. So when you click on that, you'll then be able to click a picture which now creates a, a photo that kind of rotates around and gives you this dramatic look and feel as if the image is live, is rotating, a little bit of a 3D effect. So. It actually looks pretty nifty and it's a quick seven second video. So um, generally a small thing, it takes maybe about 10 or 15 seconds to create and it'll create that wide, uh, um, it'll create that image at the aspect ratio of that picture. Um, so you can easily share it, you can send it, you know, on your um, communication apps of choice. So WhatsApp, text message or whatever, anything like that. The only place that's kind of weird is um, like on YouTube Shorts and potentially TikTok as well. But let's say you wanted to create a YouTube Short for that picture, you will have to crop it a little bit or use the YouTube Photo Editor to make those edits so it crops it into a square or crops it into a rectangle. So you're not going to get the full image that's rotating, but you should be able to you know drag it around to have it focus on the area that you want. So. Um, if you want to check out some of the images that I did that with, go ahead on over to the YouTube channel, um, youtube.com slash pateln01, and I uploaded a few different pictures so you can kind of see what it looks like. The higher resolution photo that you start with, the better, so it looks that much better, but theoretically it should work on any picture, but like I said, if you have a high resolution picture, then it'll work that much better and look that much better, but I thought I would share that, um, little nifty little feature. I kind of liked it. I learned about it earlier this week so I thought I would give it a shot to see what it does. So I'm kind of thinking about doing that a little bit more, creating more YouTube shorts just based on pictures I take or even do it on some of the, my older pictures as well and tie them together or something like that. But that is all for this particular episode. I got really not much else to talk about so oh and actually I do have one other thing to talk about. I didn't really have too much time to uh, delve into, but potentially as a review for next week. Um, if you are a Linux user or you have an old laptop that you're looking to get rid of, but or maybe even repurpose, but you don't want to get rid of, um, I always recommend with laptops, if you have an older laptop, like within the past, you know, five to seven years, one of the best things you can do is replace a hard drive with an SSD, but then what do you do with an operating system? Um, operating systems like Windows 7 and 8 are no longer supported. Windows 10 might be too high, require too high of system requirements. It's gonna um, have reach its end of life in the next couple of years. So I recommend using Linux. So now for the past about a year or so, I wanna say maybe six months to a year, I've been using KDE Neon. But let's say you wanted something that has a little bit more of a simplified UI, a little bit more of a Windows 7 look, doesn't necessarily have all the theming options or you don't necessarily use all those theming options, then one of the other distrib Linux distributions to use is Linux Mint. So the reason I'm recommending that now and after using it for this week is because it has that simple layout. It doesn't have all those extensive theming options that you know KDE Neon or other KDE based distributions have but it gives you that same Windows like UI so you have a familiar interface um, you can install you know your usual apps like um, OpenOffice for word processing and spreadsheets uh, Google Chrome if you use that as a browser it does come with Firefox pre-installed um, you can install Dropbox and Steam and various other photo and video editors so it is a very 
robust um, operating system, but if you're not into much of all that extensive stuff, you just want a web browser or checking emails, um, watching YouTube videos, social, going to social media sites and things like that, then Linux Mint is an even easier version of Linux than uh, KDE Neon. Um, the installation is about on par there. It's not very difficult. You know, it asks you for things like your time zone. Uh, do you want to install some extra packages for like multimedia codes and drivers and things like that? Um, and then it'll ask you to set up your profile. Installation is a breeze, especially from a flash drive. So within a, or not even in maybe in like two hours or less, even one hour or, or less, if your computer is strong, powerful enough, um, it's a very easy installation to get it all installed. You're up and running. You can tweak your um, settings for visual stuff. So you can change your mouse pointer to some one of the various ones that are installed, change the color scheme, change it to light or dark mode. It'll walk you through with a welcome screen to install updates, make sure all your drivers are installed and all of that. And so once you're done, you're done. You're easy, you're ready to go, you're set up. You can have the notification for updates either always show or only show up when there's updates so you can save on an icon there and that's the bulk of it i mean it's really easy to use it's very reminiscent of like a windows 90a windows me installation but with a look at, with a ui that's similar to windows 7 so even windows xp it's a similar ui to windows xp even but or windows xp or 7 they're close enough to in similarity but it's one of those things where if you're on an older bit of hardware, you want to donate it, your laptop to somebody and give them a system that's easy to use and ready to go. Installing Linux Mint um, may be the option over many other distributions. And that's not to say that other distributions are bad or um, worse than Linux Mint. And it's not to say that Linux Mint is the best distribution. But it's the one to, uh, you can use to give people, to jump them into a alternative to Windows. It's lighter weight, so everything runs smoothly. Boot time is um, the same or better. Um, you can run the same programs or better or equivalent versions. So it's not like you're going to miss out on a lot of stuff if you're not much for, you know, Office 365 or having a lot of the Windows stuff pre-installed to um, use a lot of their stuff then uh, Linux Mint is most likely the way to go. So as I use it, or I continue to use it over the next few weeks, I'll give updates as needed, but um, early review is that it's really good, especially the latest version. That As of this recording, it's at 21.1, I believe. I think 21.2 is coming out soon with like various UI updates and things for the, the, for the desktop environment, but um, overall, very easy to use. Got everything installed very easily. It's, like Chrome is as easy to install as if you're on Windows by double clicking on the installation file. It lets you install the packages, let you know if it needs to install any other support files and you're good to go. So with that being said, that is all for this particular episode. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or um, recommendations of what you're watching or something I should watch, you can comment on this post on any of the social media sites. They're all linked on the website at headphonesneal.review. Um, if you want headphonesneal.reviews, um, if you want to get early access to the podcast, um, uh, a commercial free version of the episodes and things like that, be sure to support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash pateln01. Um, as I mentioned, the YouTube channel has not only the video versions of the podcast, but the gameplay videos that I upload. So in addition to the gameplay playlist that's in the show notes, if you want a direct link to the YouTube page, it's at youtube.com slash patelin01. But that is all for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in. And next time.